And so this evening that the, the discussion is going to be art and the Buddhist path. Next, please. And a little bit more than two years ago, I presented a discussion on Buddhist art as practice. And that's because I wanted to broaden people's idea of what Buddhist practice is. We often think that it's meditation. and That's it. But it's not. And so um, that was more about Buddhist practice, practices, plural. Um, and today I want to give a slightly different approach, emphasizing the role art has played in the development of Buddhism. Thanks. Some people see Buddhist art from an aesthetic perspective only. And I'm going to tell a small little story um, that happened about 16 years ago. About 16 years ago, we had an event at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And it was the anniversary of uh, William Sturgis Bigelow and uh, some other <laughs> very important to the Boston Museum. And they were Buddhist, they were Tendai monks. And uh, they had uh, in the 18, around 1880s. And uh, William Sturgis Bigelow was one of the founders of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And uh, one of the curators was also a Tendai. Anyway, that's what it was about. But as part of that, we did a Goma ritual, the fire ritual ceremony, right in front of the museum. And how many people attended that? Probably, well, 300 were inside because the theater was the, the theater was full. That, was, that held 300. By the time we got outside, there, there were more people, at least another 100 people outside. Anyway, so when we were planning for that, um, the curator uh, of the Asian section, uh, who happened to be in the Berkshires at the time, said, well, why don't we get together and talk about the event that we're planning on doing and that sort of thing. And so that's a great idea. And so she comes over and she goes in the in our hondo and she sees the Gomadan, the the altar that we that we sit at. And um, so while she was she was there, she said, Oh, by the way, uh, what Gomadan are you going to do for the Goma ritual outside the museum? And I said, um, well I was thinking of really really appropriate to use the one that you have in the museum. And she looked at me aghast, and she said, what? You want to use the Goma, the museum Gomadon? And I said, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, no, 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 that's a piece of art. And then we go into the hondo, and she looks at our Gomadon, and, and, and she said, so what Gomadon are you going to use? I said, this one, then, if you don't let us use the one in the museum. She said, this? This is a beautiful piece of art. It's nicer than the one we have in the museum. You can't use that. <laughs> and so the point that I'm making is when we talk about art and Buddhist art, from an art historian's perspective, it is something which is a feast for the eyes. Not to say that from a Buddhist perspective, we don't appreci appreciate the aesthetics, but it's most often also functional. And so one of the things to remember about Buddhist art is that it's functional art. It's not something that's made only for the aesthetics. It's something which is functional that is made to be aesthetically pleasing. But that's one of the decisions I want to make. And so to go, and, and by the way, she was, she was absolutely flabbergasted that, that we actually schlepped the Gomadon all the way to Boston and back uh, from, our, from our hondo. In, in the pouring rain. In the pouring rain, exactly. We did we did the goma in the pouring rain also. Um, and just to, just to let you know that art is an expression of human experience. And as you see here, it started, Buddhist art started as symbolism. And specifically, you see a footprint, an empty seat, something along those lines. And, and Buddhism early on eschewed the idea of life-like representation. So there was no lifelike representation. Um, it then developed as a repository for the cranes of Shakyamuni Buddha, which were housed in a stupa. And the stupas became a type of art. Uh, the, the remains were, were kept in 
the stupas. And then eventually those stupas were surrounded by another building and another building, and that's how Buddhist architecture really began in India. Um, and then in the first century CE, the human image of one Buddha came to dominate, and typically that was Shakyamuni Buddha, but as we'll see, that changed as time went on. Um, and one of the first sites at which this was occurred was along India's northwestern frontier, the area then known as Gandhara, which is now um, western Pakistan, Afghanistan, that area, um, in the Kush Valley. The Mahayana spread across Asia. We had heavenly bodhisattvas that became the subject of art. And I will suggest the art promulgated Mahayana thought. So it's not just that the art represented philosophies, ideas, concepts, teachings, but the art itself began to take on a life of its own and then influenced um, Mahayana thought. And at that time, ritual implements manifest as sacred objects. The ink drawing that you see here is Basho's famous haiku. Basho was the poet from 1644 to 1694 was born to a samurai family, but then became, um, was really wanted to pursue a, a literary uh, life. And he left his family and devoted himself as a Zen practitioner. And one can see Zen Buddhist influence in his work. Conversely, his poetry became associated with Zen practice and the haiku he wrote, an evocation of the Buddhist philosophy. And so, the old pond, a frog jumps in, plop. And this is a, a picture of that. So this is a, a an example of uh, 17th century, 18th century poetry and art uh, combined that we that we see here. So <clears throat> we'll go in a more in a more organized fashion now, in a more chronologic fashion. Next, please. So when we start with the Buddhist uh, and Japanese aesthetics, uh, and and I always Lafleur's writing here, I always I always found it interesting, and he writes to uh, brings to light how perception of atmospheric beauty, and I'm using his words now as yugen or profound mystery, had its basis in Tendai meditation practices of Shikan. This is from, this is from uh, uh, LaFleur. The Buddha taught a middle way between the extremes of sensual indulgence and self-mortification. So in early Buddhism, before they had actual representation, uh, the emphasis, especially for monks and nuns, was on avoiding activities that might arouse worldly desires. No dancing, no singing, no appreciating all that art over there sort of thing. Um, and Buddhist art and poetry focused on overtly Buddhist themes, so it had to be directly related to, to the Dharma, to the teaching. This tendency toward renunciation created a potential conflict with mainstream figures in China, Korea, Japan, when Buddhism was introduced to East Asia. Shedding a worldly pleasure and attachments might seem to require that such flowers of culture as poetry, literature, and visual arts were not pursued except in relation to ritual objects such as stupas that held Buddha's bones that became the objects of veneration. However, later Mahayana views developed in a different developed a different emphasis. By claiming that the phenomenal world is not distinct from Dharma, Tendai doctrine allows for the reconciliation of beauty and aesthetics with Buddhist teachings. Things are to be seen just as they are as an expression of Dharma. And we'll move on um, from there. Next, please. Is this a, uh, no, I'm sorry. Is, is, there, is that writing, those letters, or is that, that just lines? No, though that is, that is uh, Japanese calligraphy. So though that's, that's actually uh, a poem, a Japanese poem. Now, having said that, calligraphy is an art form in and of itself. And so the um, visual representation is often as important as the whatever is being written about, the saying, the, the 
whatever it happens to be. And if is mommy here? Yes, sir. Um, she may or may not be able to read that one. <laughs> And, and remembering it's it's red top down right to left. Yeah, it's red it's red from white right to left from top to down. Can you read that one, Tommy? Yeah, no. <laughs> so so in that sense, it really is uh, art as opposed to just the poem that is a, that it is about. Uh, as an example, um, is, did I say next? Yeah, next, please. <clears throat> I'm, I'll get a little bit more di didactic here before I become less didactic. Um, Buddhist statues were first used as sources of inspiration and veneration. The image was influenced by art throughout Asia, including Persia, Western China, as well as India. And many Buddhist practices require the follower to visualize a particular Buddha to receive the Buddha's blessings. Because of the intense focus on the image of the Buddhas themselves, statues were created for the purposes of veneration and to ensure proper visualization. In practice, they serve as a source of light and peace for the practitioner to visualize. In these pictures, we see what is considered the origins of Buddhist representations from the Indian subcontinent. Gandharan art, it's a style of Buddhist visual art that developed in what is now uh, Northwestern Pakistan and Eastern Afghanistan between the first century BCE and seventh century CE. The style of Greco-Roman origin seems to have flourished largely during the Kushan dynasty and was contemporaneous with important but dissimilar schools of Kushan art of the Mathura, which is Uttar Pradesh, India today. The picture on the left is these, that figure is, I'm trying to remember exactly how tall it is now. It's, it's something like, I'm going to say close to 100 feet tall to give you a, an idea of the scale of this. That's a mountain that it's sitting in, okay? And so the figure on the left is a reconstruction of how the main figure may have appeared when it was first carved as a bas-relief going back um, many centuries. Bamiyan lies on the Silk Road, which runs through the Hindu Kush Mountains region in the Bamiyan Valley, and it was a site of several Buddhist monasteries and a thriving center for religion, philosophy, and art. Monks of the monasteries lived as hermits in small caves carved in the side of the Bamiyan cliffs. And you'll see in the picture on the right what look like little holes. Those are caves in the mountain that the monks lived in. And most of these monks embellished their caves with religious statuary and elaborate, brightly colored frescoes sharing the culture of Gandhara. The picture on the right <coughs> is what the statues looked like in the early 20th century before they were destroyed by the Taliban in 2001. Present-day inhabitants of the area who follow Islam and speak the Hasgari, Azragi dialect of Darik Persian, call the largest statue, Sal Sal, the light shines through the universe and identifies it as a male. And the shorter statue is called Shamama, the queen mother, identifying it as a female figure. And so this gives you an idea, the Gandharan style is the style that you see on the left with that particular style of robes that are um, flowing. Um, very Romo Greco, when you, when you look at the face and, and you, will be, you will read that the Gandharan style really copied the uh, gods that you found in the Roman and Greek pantheons and the style that the, that the gods, the deities um, were portrayed as. Next, please. <clears throat> the Gandharan contribution. The schools of Gandhara and Mathura influenced each other, and the general trend was away from a naturalistic conception and toward a more idealized, abstract image. And the Gandharan craftsmen made a lasting contribution to Buddhist art in their composition of the events of the Buddhist life in set scenes. So the scene that we see there is a scene that you <coughs> find throughout uh, the Indian subcontinent, uh, Afghanistan, Persia, um, Pakistan, etc., which had a lot to do with uh, representation of tales that came from the Jataka tales or other other specific um, uh, Buddhist uh, part of Buddhist legend. The confluence of Gandharan art and early Mahayana is significant as the Mahayana or Bodhisattva Yana 
was transitioning from a more psychologic and static Buddhism of the Shravakiana to one that was more dynamic, inspirational, and imaginative. The art itself was informing the how and development of the new schools arising throughout Northern, Western, and East Asia. Though th this may have started with this, I'm sorry, this may have started with Gandharan influences, art in many styles and forms continued to stimulate the philosophy of East Asia, of China, Korea, Vietnam, and Japan as well, and later in time in Tibet. We'll look briefly at other art modalities that we should keep in the back of our mind, and the, there's the aesthetic of the art, the message of the art, and in converse, the art that was informing the philosophy and the practices. We'll also be focusing more on Japan and Tendai specifically in order to explore the topic in a short period of time. And the point that I'm trying to make about the Gandharan contribution was that there was not, most art was commissioned by patrons. Patrons would then say, here's what I would like to see, in the same way that a patron of art might today. They, they would say, I'd, I'd like to see a picture of Martin Luther King, or I'd like to see a statue of Martin Luther King. And the particular sculpture was then, is then often left to their own devices in terms of how to represent that. It was the same situation then. But here's what happened that's really interesting. You see it starting in the Gandharan period. And, and I, did Ichishima say take him in? Or you um, don't remember? Anyway, see him. Um, what you'll see is that many influences from, in this case, the Gandharan is, is, is really influenced by the um, uh, Roman Greco style. There's also Zoroastrian influences. And there's influences from other places. As these other influences were used artistically, that art then gave a kind of informed view to the philosophy. So it was the interrelationship between the philosophy, the teachings, and the art as they worked together. It's not that there was a strict orthodox philosophy that was then being put into stone or iconography or whatever it might have been. It's that they, they sort of worked back and forth. They, they informed each other. And I think that that's really important. Yes? What is the significance of the animal figures? Well, some because, of them were humanized too. Right, and 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 that's why I'm saying this probably came from a Jataka tale. In the Jataka tales, you'll see the Buddha was a monkey in a previous lifetime, I and so this may be a represent. I, I don't know exactly, but this may be a representation of one of the tales in which that was the case. And what is in the left hand? Uh, he's holding. He's holding his robe. Oh, okay. He's he's holding his robe. Up. What are they doing below him? Um, you know, we probably don't want to discuss it uh, <laughs> the airways. Yeah. Unless this was on cable, that might be that might be more of acrobatics. But that would that wouldn't be unusual when we when we see some of these. But that's a good question. Next, please. <laughs> that's an art major. Art in Sutra. This illustration is painted on the front piece that precedes the written scripture, and it combines depictions of three episodes from chapters 12 to 15 of the Lotus Sutra. Its composition skillfully combines iconic images of the Buddha with narrative vignettes. The Lotus Sutra emphasizes the ultimate Mahayana belief that Buddha's compassion is open to all, regardless of gender or station in life. And in the late Heian period, lavishly produced copies of this text accounted for most of the thousands of such devotional offerings commissioned by the aristocracy to gain religious merit. Just keep that in mind. If you want religious merit, we'll hand it out. You know, it's costly, but, you know, it is, it is merit. Um, following the Chinese president, these were often painted, painted in gold and silver on paper or silk dyed deep indigo or purple. And this illustration is painted on the front piece that proceeds, as I said, the scripture. It combines skillfully iconic images of the Buddha with narrative vignettes. Here, the daughter of the dragon king of the sea offers the radiant jewel to the Buddha preaching on Vulture Peak, rendering the shape of the bird's head. That is the Vulture Peak is the shape of the bird's head. 
down and and the vulture peak by the way is is the term given for where the lotus sutra was was um, uh, disseminated balancing is seen as an illustration of an episode from the buddha's former life as a king buddha so desired true wisdom that he promised all his wealth and power and lifelong servitude to whoever could reveal it here he's seen twice once kneeling before the sage who taught him and again bearing firewood in fulfillment of his vow and you'll see him on the right hand side there's an image in a cave and he's kneeling up to that image not quite sure where the firewood image is i'd have to look more carefully at it i certainly can't see it from back here such illustrated sutra are considered a means of attaining awakening by the embodiment of his imagery beyond some something beyond words and intellect here's where we have to recognize that art one of its roles was it could portray something without the person reading <coughs> what the sutra was about they could insert themselves they could project themselves into the scene and in so doing they could understand beyond what words and intellect can can convey from a more mundane perspective the beauty of the art demonstrates how valuable the teaching and the imagery oh. conveys a story in order to guide one's thoughts beyond the provisional and and from my perspective, this gold and silver on indigo dyed paper or, or uh, silk in many cases is fantastic. You see many, many examples of this. Um, uh, it's some of my favorite Buddhist art. Next, please. <clears throat> and we'll go on to iconographic art. In this case, what we have is the central platform of the Taizokai Mandala. For those who have been in Rohondo, the Taizokai Mandala, as you face the front altar, is the uh, mandala that's on the right. And this is the very center of that mandala. So this is about what, maybe one tenth, something like that, of the total of the total mandala. But it's a central platform. <clears throat> and keep in mind also. That the mandalas are represented in two dimensions because they're iconographic. On the other hand, they are read in three dimensions. And so, just in this small example here, the very bottom, which would be green, is one level. Then, the level on which the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas reside are the next level up. And then, the center figure, Dainichi Nyurai, is another level, sort of like a, imagine a pyramid with three levels. <clears throat> the mandala as a whole composes many different levels because there's many more uh, concentric uh, levels that are in, involved in there. The, what is the role of, of esoteric iconography in Buddhist art? Here I will quote Robert Scharf in his book, Living Images, Japanese Buddhist Icons in Context, that he wrote with his wife, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Contrary to virtually everything, and this quotes, contrary to virtually everything written on the subject, mandalas did not serve as aids to vi ritual visualization, nor could they have. But mandalas are better viewed as living entities necessary to ensure the efficacy of the rites performed in their presence. Later in the book, he says, it should now be clear that speculation as the conception and function of the Buddhist mandalas, and indeed all Buddhist religious icons, is of limited value unless predicated on the critical analysis of their ritual and institutional deployments. In other words, the images are treated by monks and lay persons alike, when I say monks, it's both for male and female, as living presences with considerable power to prevent evil and bring about liberation. The Japanese Buddhist monastic life was centered around the management and veneration of these spiritual beings. And just very briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, when you look at this, north is to the left. And that is the picture of Amida Nyorai Amitabha. And then south is the one at the top, you're going clockwise, which is Hosho Nyorai or Ratnasvabaha. And then followed 
next, which would be to your right, which would be east, is Ashoka Niorai, which is Ashok the buyer. And then um, I left out the bottom one. Why did I do that? But in the center is, uh, as I said before, Dainichi Nyorai, which is the Vairachana Maha Vairachana. The figures of the, the Buddhas are on the cardinal points, and the figures of the Bodhisattvas are on the, the points in between the intercardinal points. And you can tell the Bodhisattvas by the crowns that they're wearing. And there's various Bodhisattvas there. But iconographic art becomes really intertwined with um, the practices. They are, the art itself becomes a practice. That's part of the point that I wanted to make here. And so when you go in the, in the hondo, look at the two mandalas in the front, and the one on the right is a Taizokai mandala. The one on the left is the Kongokai mandala. Next, please. Shodo, the way of writing or calligraphy. And I'm just very briefly, the oldest existing calligraphic text in Japan is the inscription on the halo of the Medicine Buddha statue in Haruji Temple in Nara. And Buddhist Shodo was adopted from the Chinese in the 6th century using the Chinese characters, which in Japanese are referred to as kanji. At the time, Buddhism was introduced to Japan. There are different styles from the Heian period, also including Sanskrit, Sadim, or Bija. As an art form, the text is often taken from sutra and teachings intended to be a way of practice to learn and inspire others. We have approximately 50 formal Shodo pieces um, that we should probably have a show again soon. We do, we've, we've had that show at, at uh, Berkeley in uh, San Francisco University of California, Berkeley, in, San Francisco, in Oakland, I should say, not San Francisco. And also at the um, University of Albany, College of St. Rose, and we've done it in our in our Honda. We should do that again soon. Um, next, please. Ikebana, or flower arrangement, came to Japan as part of Buddhist practice. And they, they originally, Ikebana were literally the flower offerings on the Buddhist temple. That's the role that they played. And so the first students and teachers of Ikebana were Tendai Buddhist priests in Kyoto. To the untrained eye, Ikebana might seem like a few flowers in a bowl. The translation of the name means shed much light, with Ike meaning arrange or alive, and Bana meaning flower. And Ikebana is also sometimes referred to in relation to Kato, or the way of the flower. Each Ikebana is its own world of balance, playfulness, and tranquility. And you could look at each one for hours, focusing on each individual blade of grass, stem, stick, or flower petal, and never tire of its design. Incredibly, each ikebana also adds to the balance of the altar as a whole. The effect is a kind of visual relaxation that is at once satisfying and mystifying. You realize, as you continue to appreciate the earthly balance in front of you, that you are unconsciously practicing a fundamental Buddhist tradition of allowing the mind to exist in the present moment. Mommy gave us a demo and, years ago. And to bask in the calmness and serenity of the body. And so when you go in the hondo again this evening, look at the altar and you'll see an Ikebana arrangement on the altar. Put simply, Ikebana is not just a few flowers in a bowl, it's an art form and a spiritual journey, an integral piece of Japanese Buddhist tradition. Next, please. Uta, or poetry. The Buddhist world has produced numerous poets, and this is from Gary Snyder, and singers of the Dharma whose works are still admired and loved. Mili Repa, whose songs are known by the heart among Tibetans, and Basho, whom we spoke about previously, whose haiku, haiku are read worldwide and perhaps the most famous. Gary Snyder also writes, <coughs> poetry has also been a part of Buddhism from early on, from the 2,500 years ago, songs of the forest-dwelling monks and nuns in India, to the vivid colloquial poems of Kenji Miyazawa in the 1930s Japan. There's a continuous thread. Poetry has had a primary place of respect in Chinese literary culture, and many of the other, many of the best-known poets of the Chinese canon 
are touched with Chan and Taoist insight. Some of the finest poets of China were even acknowledged, were acknowledged John adepts by Jui and Su Dangpo, to name just two. Unquote. Ujiwara Shunze acknowledges the Tendai basis of the aesthetic theory in Japan. In this text, Shunze asserts that the infinite depth and profound meaning of poetry are akin to Shikan meditation of Tendai Buddhism as described by its founder, Shigi, in the 6th century. For Shunze, the Japanese lyric called Uta is a process of transmission of the Dharma, similar in transmission of awakening running through the Tendai leaders. Moreover, Japanese poetry is said by Shunze to have dimensions of depth that has an affinity with the three stages of truth in Tendai Buddhism, showing the identity of the provisional, shunyata, and the middle way. Better wrap this up pretty soon, huh? <clears throat> I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. That's a non-Japanese poem. <laughs> <laughs> the, Jap the, Jap the use of Japanese tea developed as a transformative practice, practice and began to evolve its own aesthetic, wabi-sabi. Wabi is the inner spiritual experiences of human lives, characteristic of quiet humility, restraint, simplicity, naturalism. Sabi, on the other hand, represents the outer or material side of life, impermanence, worn, weathered, or decayed. This really describes how I feel today. <laughs> This is considered as the most effective means to awakening. While embracing imperfection, it is a reminder to cherish our unpolished selves here and now just as we are, which is the first step to Satori or enlightenment. The powdered green tea was first used in religious rituals in Buddhist monasteries in the 13th century. In the 1906 Book of Tea, written by the scholar Okakura Kakuzo, who was a, one of the um, curators of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and a, the person who accompanied William Sturgis Bigelow and others in Japan. Um, he writes as follows, <clears throat> speaking of Chanda, it insulates purity and harmony, the mystery of mutual charity, the romanticism of the social order, it is essentially a worship of the imperfect, as it is tender attempt to accomplish something possible in this impossible thing we know as life." Unquote. Sen no Riku was the leading tea master of the region Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who greatly supported him in codifying and spraying the way of tea in the 16th century. And so in this particular picture, the person you see is actually the son of one of the three schools of tea of Chado in Japan. And he is a direct descendant of Sen no Rikyu and a Tendai monk. And so this was, what, what's the year? 2008. So at the time, um, Sooku, which means next in line. <laughs> <laughs> because he'll be the person who will be the head of the tea ceremony <laughs> when his father dies. Isn't that, isn't that great to have somebody around you say, hey, you're next in line. <laughs> Wait till I die. <laughs> uh, <laughs> is that how it feels, Koshin? Yeah, it's only right. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe, maybe we should start calling him Sooku. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, when he, he was uh, in New York, or living in New York for a year as a cultural ambassador, and he made his way up here on a number of occasions. And uh, he will stay here whenever he comes to the East Coast of the United States because he considers the Tendai Buddhist Institute has his American temple. Next, Sooku is a Tendai priest. Pardon me? Yes, I mentioned he himself is a, is a Tendai, Tendai monk. Next, please. And I'm just going to give one more. And this is Shomyo, the classical chant of Buddhism in Japan, 
Many sects maintain the tradition, although it's found primarily in Tendai and Shinbakshu, and use its theoretical books and notational system as the basis for other forms of Buddhist singing. Although derived from earlier Chinese sources, the major influence of shomyo nomenclature and performance practices are found in later Japanese music, much in the way that Western art music is based on early Roman Catholic music theory. So when we speak about gaku, which is a Japanese court style of music, that's coming out of shomyo originally. And historians tell us the Gregorian chants in shomyo were derived from the same source in Western Asia, and that they are related in their forms. And so that there's a relationship, and no one knows for sure whether shomyo came first or Gregorian chants came first, but they are definitely related. Of course, they, according to historians of both Gregorian and shomyo practices. It is said that Shomyo is a sound that Shakyamuni Buddha made when delivering his discourses. Next. <clears throat> so I realized at this point in preparing the presentation that was already too long. <laughs> so I didn't include architecture, landscaping, and other arts. And I'll stop here. Let me conclude by saying that the Buddhist path that we know is what it is because of the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha the commentary and expanded teachings of the ancestors, the lineage to which we belong, and not in small part to the interaction of philosophy, practice, and art. Spaha. Thanks.